There we go. All right, we're on. Yay. Okay. The camera is on. <laughs> Lights, camera. Hello, fellow students. Um, all right, so we finished our quiz, and now we're going to talk about the Socratic um, seminar form. So this is something we're doing next week. Um, this form is on the teacher grade link page. So you all need to print yourself a copy. It looks like this. If you can't get it to work, please let me know. Um, I will probably send it out in my reminder email this week. I'll send it as an attachment just to be safe. But you're going to need this form next week printed. And you are going to fill out um, some of the form. This is a grade in the grade book for the eight weeks. So you definitely want to um, do this correctly. So you're going to write down three higher level thinking questions for next week's discussion. That's what you're going to put under focus questions. Um, you do not have to staple any animated text to this. So it says that in the directions. You don't have to do that. So this is your ticket to get to participate in the Socratic um, discussion next week for your grade. You need to come up with higher level thinking questions, three questions right here. Uh-huh. Um, what is the questions on? Um, okay, we're getting to that. Okay, I was, I was like, I feel like we skipped over this detail. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll get there. Um, you need to have brief answers to your own questions. Okay, so you need to answer your own three questions there. All right, and then do not put anything in the quick write section. Okay, don't put anything. We'll, add, we'll fill that in next week. So you need to have, um, oh, this is page one, so I forgot to bring page two to show you, sorry. Um, students should at least include two ideas or themes per box for page two, okay? So, let me see, I might can pull up page two. Yeah, here we go. All right, so we have Socratic Seminar Preparation Guide. You can see on there. So key passages and page numbers, astute observation and insights, character settings and plot points that you would like to discuss, symbols, themes, and literary elements that you would like to discuss, and connection to other texts or illusions that provide insight. Remember, an illusion is like a historical event or something common that everybody can relate to. When I say 9-11, everybody knows what that is. Um, Pearl Harbor, everybody knows what that is. So an illusion is something like that. So, um, Our Socratic seminar is over the Scarlet Letter. So you have to have the Scarlet Letter read by next week. Um, and you have to have these forms filled out for our Socratic seminar. So we have to fill out page two, two before next week? Yes. You're going to fill out everything but the quick write section for the two pages. For the Scarlet Letter. Yes, finish reading the Scarlet Letter. Um, you can use the audio book or the PDF. Is the PDF working now? Oh, good, okay. So you can use either one. The participant form is on the uh, grade link page as of yesterday. Um, make sure, page one, you write down three higher level thinking questions. And you don't have to staple animated text to it. And then you have to provide the responses to your three questions. Yes. So I have a physical copy of the book, so that means my page numbers are probably going to be different than the ones that are provided in the PDF. So when it comes to the second page and they ask you for the page numbers, is it okay if I put the ones from the book rather than trying to buy them from the ones in the PDF? That's fine, as long as you can bring your book and as long as you can read the section if we need to look it up. Okay. Okay. Um, Leave the quick write blank until next week. You're going to include two items per box, two items or ideas. Okay? And you have to bring the forms to 
participate in the discussion, and this is, it's, it's a, you know, significant part of your grade, so. All right? Um, and that's what we'll be doing next week. Uh, you're also to read Lesson 4, The Fall of the House of Usher. And um, I think that's it. So we are going to um, have a significant amount of time for our Socratic seminar discussion next week. Um, there will be a quiz. <laughs> I know, I saw Josh's hand. Um, there will be quiz seven. So, uh, Let me guess, it's on scope. No, it can't be. Quiz seven will be over chapter seven. Oh, uh, so I got on post. So do chapter seven. So um, there'll be two things due next week. Your Socratic seminar participant form, both pages ready to participate in the discussion. And what's going to happen is we're going to try to somehow circle up a little bit better, but we'll, um, we'll have our discussion and we'll, <laughs> we'll um, uh, I'll give you a prompt. Like I'll say, a, I'll throw a theory or a question out there and then based on your information is how you're going to get to participate and and we're just going to have a, a good discussion, okay? So if you come prepared, it'll be fun. So, and, and it's a, you know, if you do what you're supposed to do and you participate, it's probably an easier grade than taking a test next week, right? So. Yeah. Oh, there's still a quiz, so. <laughs> there's still a quiz on chapter seven, sorry. So that's just um, how it goes. And it's actually helping you because there is going to be a test over the scarlet letter on week nine. Oh, so, just the scarlet letter? So this is helping you study and prepare for your test. It's kind of like a group study. Oh, it's wonderful. It'll be fun. Mm -hmm. No problem. Okay. So any questions about the Socratic seminar? What defines a higher level of a question that has three questions in it. <laughs> a question that has more questions in it. I think it's one that like makes you think rather than like, what is this character's dog's thing? I don't know. Yeah, like like what something is, that's more what like. What is the main character? That's the most. That's like. What's the hidden motive of well, the character? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. I don't want our time to get away from us too much. I want you to have time to watch. I brought a movie about Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe's life, very short. It's like less than 10 minutes, but it's very interesting because you can find out about it. Um, okay, so uh, the goal of the Socratic seminar is to exchange ideas, thoughtful questioning, um, express ideas. It's kind of a collective inquiry. It's for, to help you learn more and maybe you know, it's like taking a box and turning it and seeing it from a different perspective. Because obviously, you know, there's six people in the room, we're all going to have a different perspective when we read something. Um, we're going to, the focus is it's a text-based conversation. Um, I'm going to throw out a question or um, try to create some curiosity with the question, and then we're going to try to um, um, just participate and learn. Now, when you say a higher, what's a higher level question, like don't say, um, who is the main character of the story? That's not a higher level thinking question. A higher level thinking question is, how does this character relate to this character? Or do you remember when we had the discussion about Star Wars and the different levels within Star Wars and the world views? Um, it's to have a little bit higher level thinking, okay? So all of you are higher level thinking. Thinkers, I know you'll come up with good questions. So I think it'll be fun and you'll actually enjoy it. Um, and we're not having to be on the phone this time. 
Last time, oh, last that, year, that was we were on the phone, <laughs> and that was really hard, wasn't it? So this I year, tried to block that out of my memory of that discussion because that, that was, was so hard. I, that, it was, that was like my least favorite part of the class, right? There was the discussions just because it was so hard with the phone. It was like I couldn't hear your Josh, Josh, like, yeah. remember to unmute your mic, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I do remember that. Please mute your mic so I don't hear all the dogs in the background. So, <laughs> and stuff. Okay. Um, well, it'll be way more fun because we'll be in person this year. So, um, questions about what it, what you have to do this week? No. Okay. No. I'll try to send out a hint about Chapter Seven quiz um, in the email this week. So. Don't forget to print the form and actually fill it out. All right, so this week we're studying Edgar Allan Poe. Yes. And you're going to get to read some of his works. And this biography was really, really interesting. There's creepy things about him. And there's uh, yeah. very interesting right. things about him. And so um, it'll be very interesting to, to watch the video. So, any questions about anything else going on with the class? Questions about the class? Um, I was just trying to think about if he died, like if he wrote about his death and then he actually died about that in the year. You will see. Are you guys in the Okay. Well, let's see. Edgar Allan Poe is a pop culture legend. His works have been translated into nearly every language. His legacy as the inventor of detective fiction has kept him in more than just literature textbooks. He's known to have influenced such great horror writers as Stephen King, Alfred Hitchcock, and even science fiction's Ray Bradbury. His stories have been made into countless film adaptations. Even his famous poem, The Raven, was part of The Simpsons' very first Treehouse of Horrors Halloween episode. It might not be a surprise to those who have read Poe's works that he had a rather sad childhood. Edgar Poe was born on January 19, 1809 in Boston, the second of three children. His parents, who were traveling actors, died when he was young, so he was sent to live with a wealthy merchant, John Allen, and his wife Frances, in Richmond, Virginia. Frances served as a good mother to Edgar, but John proved to be a less than supportive foster father. Despite the fact that they never adopted Edgar, Alan was added to his last name, and he spent his younger years traveling with the couple and learning the family business. Poor Edgar wasn't terribly interested and spent a good deal of his time writing poems instead. By the age of 13, he had enough poems to publish an anthology, but he was discouraged by both his teacher and his foster father, who preferred he stay in the family business. At the age of 17, Poe left for the University of Virginia. But because his foster father would not help him pay his bills, he wound up in debt. To offset this, Poe turned to gambling, which only made matters worse. It is said that Poe became so desperately poor that he had to burn his furniture to keep warm. That was a turning point in Poe's relationship with Mr. Allen. Poe resented him for not helping him financially, especially since there was plenty of money available. His situation worsened when he returned home from school to find his fiancée engaged to someone else. While this was all devastating to Poe, he vowed that he would find success and publish his first book, Tamerlane, under the name Edgar A. Perry. He was only 18. He also enlisted in the Army, and after two years of service, he returned home in hopes of seeing Frances, the only mother he had known, who had become sick. Sadly, he arrived too late to say his goodbyes, a tragedy which haunted him. He remained in Richmond long enough to publish another book of poetry before heading to West Point. He wasn't there for long, though. After starting, Poe heard that John Allen had remarried without telling Poe or inviting him to the wedding. Since Poe was there on Allen's recommendation, he did his best to get kicked out. As a result, Poe chose to focus on writing and completely severed ties with Mr. Allen. In 1831, at the age of 22, he moved to Baltimore, and after being robbed by one of his relatives, wound up staying with his aunt Maria Clem, who became a mother to him. He also lived with his young cousin, Virginia. Poe continued to live in poverty in Baltimore. Even when Allen died, he left Poe out of his will, so Poe received no help from the man who had raised him. To make money, Poe wrote and sold short stories. 
This eventually led to a position at the Southern Literary Messenger as an editor and a critic, which moved him back to Richmond. Within a year, the magazine became extremely popular thanks to Poe's stories and nasty reviews. By the age of 27, Poe was able to bring Maria and Virginia to Richmond. In 1836, he married his cousin Virginia. She was only 13 years old. Mostly the 1830s and 1840s were good to Poe. He moved to New York, to Philadelphia, and back to New York. He wrote some of his best stories and became famous in his own time, quite a feat for any writer, though it didn't make him rich. In 1845, Poe's popularity exploded with the publication of The Raven. He traveled the country presenting lectures and solidifying his reputation. However, in 1847, his treasured wife Virginia died, and Poe began to struggle. He was no stranger to loss, but that didn't ease the tragedy of losing his 24-year-old wife. He suffered from writer's block for months. His short but tormented life came to a tragic end on October 7, 1849. He briefly disappeared, only to be found five days later in a bar that was being used as an election polling station. He was struggling to stay alive. No one really knows where he had been or what brought about Poe's death. At the time, it was believed to be congestion of the brain. Other speculation has blamed alcoholism. His literary adversary, Rufus Griswold, wrote a nasty, vengeful obituary of Poe in hopes of paying him back for the critiques Poe made of Griswold's work. His account of the author's life, which began with, this announcement will startle many, but few will be grieved by it, claimed that Poe had few or no friends and led people to believe that Poe led a drug and alcohol-induced life. This is the biography that most people know of Poe, though many sources say these are only myths. Nonetheless, Griswold's attempts to attack Poe only brought more attention to his work, causing sales to skyrocket. Of course, with all of this tragedy in his life, it is no wonder that Poe often wrote about madmen, murder, being buried alive, and death. His psychological thrillers, however, gave way to the modern-day mystery, making him the father of the detective story. His 1841 publication of The Birders in the Room War was the first of these stories and the first to introduce C. August Dupin, Poe's recurring detective. Unlike some writers, though, Poe wrote in a variety of forms. His most popular pieces are short stories like The Telltale Heart, The Mask of the Red Death, and The Fall of the House of Usher, and poems like The Raven and Annabelle Lee. However, he also wrote essays, including one called The Philosophy of Composition, which shows the method he used to write The Raven. He wrote one play and one novel as well. As a literary critic and an editor, Poe was known to be quite harsh and made many enemies easily. He was especially critical of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poetry, believing it to be poorly written. Poe is said to have been influenced by Lord Byron, a famous English romantic poet. However, minus characters who have self-destructive tendencies, their styles are very different. Poe's use of diction, or word choice, is the start of what makes him stand apart from other writers. In his short story, The Fall of the House of Usher, he uses the words like bleak, rank, depression of the soul, and hideous dropping off of the veil to describe the House of Usher. This pretty heavy word choice is both sophisticated and chock full of terrifying connotations or emotional meanings. Of course, it only follows that this use of such diction leads to horrific imagery, where he uses words to create a picture in the reader's mind. One of Poe's most famous images comes from the first line of his poem, The Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary. While he doesn't use long, lavish descriptions in this line of the poem, we can easily see in our mind's eye the night he describes. It's pitch black at midnight. A dull rain pattering on what is probably a lifeless backdrop. And because the narrator is so tired, those images are amplified in his mind, too. The other stories are more grotesque in nature. And even others do not create images of the setting, but images of what the narrator is thinking. It's those images that add to the overall effects of his stories. These elements are further explored in Poe's works and additional lessons in this course. Let's summarize. Edgar Allan Poe is known as the creator of the detective story and the modern mystery. He didn't just write short stories. He also wrote poems, essays, and even a novel and a play. Because he was heavily influenced by many tragedies in his life, his writing was usually dark and morbid. 
Through the use of diction and terrifying imagery, Poe is able to take readers into the dark realms of the world as well as the horrifying depths of the mind. He used these techniques in such famous works as The Raven, The Telltale Heart, and The Fall of the House of Usher. His stories and poems are still widely read today, making him one of America's most popular writers. Okay. That probably gave you a lot of information about him. Um, on the teacher grade link page, there's a link for the Telltale Heart video. And it's a guy performing the poem, and he does such a good job. It's at the Museum of Edgar Allan Poe, and he's an actor that they hire to come and do the performance on a regular basis. And he, someone asked him in the audience some questions. There's like a Q&A session at the end, if you've watched it, um, where somebody asked him, how, what's, how did he really die and everything. And one of the interesting theories is that apparently back then they would, um, it was an election day, and they would get people and dress them up in different clothes over and over again and get them drunk and take them back and forth to the polling booth so they could vote multiple times for a particular candidate. And so he was found in clothes that were not his own, they were too big. He was found in a bar. Um, so that was one of the speculative theories as he was trying to get earn money by doing that on that particular day. So, um, so if you get a chance, definitely click on that link and watch that. It doesn't take very long and it, it really brings the telltale heart to life and you understand it much better seeing it performed live. Questions about next week or Anything? We're going to read all the House of Usher.